All right, wonderful. You guys have done it. Um, you are in your rooms with your masks. You are watching this live stream and it's working, hopefully. If it's not working, shoot me a text. But uh, <laughs> this is kind of the vibe and, and what it's gonna be like for students. Um, as soon as that seven o'clock hits, I'm gonna jump on and be doing announcements, starting the night off and taking you through it. And it's gonna be something to get used to, to be watching the screen but being in person, um, it will be a very interesting time, but I know that you guys are adaptable and you guys are the best small group leaders I know. Um, and it's gonna be just a, a new treat for these students. It's gonna be interesting, can't wait. Um, one logistic thing before we get started with the night, um, I'm gonna show you, Marsha, who came up and talked, I'm gonna show you a video she made about uh, these tea locks, I believe they're called, and we're all gonna actually get up and practice this so uh, I'm gonna play a quick video right now of Marsha teaching you how to use them and it's for lockdowns just in case there's an active shooter situation or something like that so um, take this seriously let's get those T locks down and I'm gonna play this video follow along all right real quick we're just gonna do a demonstration of how to use the T locks that are located in each classroom they've recently been installed um, during the COVID break um, but familiarize yourself with whatever room you're working in because the boxes are in different places along the door frame depending on the configuration of the room. Uh, first and foremost, real uh, important thing is to get the T-lock out of the box. You just want to flip up the top with your thumb and open it up, pull out the device, it's real simple, and bend over, it slides into the hardware on the floor and the door, and you're good to go. Just. That way nobody can get in. Okay, so I'm gonna give you about a minute to just go over. You can do this while I'm talking. Feel free to stand up and one of you go over, uh, flip the lid, get the T-lock, uh, slide it in and, and make sure that works. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit more time. I'm sure some of you are just like pros at it. Some of you are, have already got it in. Give yourself a high five if you've already done that. <laughs> but most of us are probably struggling fumbling at it. I see you. I know you're str <laughs> struggling. All right, about 15 more seconds. Can you get the T-lock in? We'll see. There you go. Okay, so um, that is for an active shooter situation. Feel free to take that out, put it back in, and we can get on with the night. But also listen along because I'm going to be flying through some stuff. So here we go. Um, so imagine that you just got out of your VIP meeting, you've walked down the hallway to your room and uh, you ask, what do we do next? We just practiced how to turn the TVs on and that's the first thing I want you to do. I do want you to turn the TVs on and get to that live stream as soon as possible. You might ask why. Um, there's a couple of things. One, when the kids aren't there, it's gonna be a lot easier to, to get through stuff without having to interact. Two, um, the music on the live stream actually gives the whole church some energy. So you can imagine students walking from the parking lot into an empty hallway and if it were just dead silence, it would be a very awkward experience, right? So we wanna make that experience way better than just walking into an empty, silent hallway. So this is what we're gonna do. You have the music playing and it will be kind of filling the, uh, the hallways with music. So as students come in, they feel like there's energy. They feel like, hey, this is a fun place that I, I wanna be here. And secondly, and probably most important, music is okay, but um, the really important thing is the human element. What do, you, what do I mean by that, you ask? Uh, you are sitting in a room, hopefully with two leaders, some even more sixth grade girls, well done. Um, one out of the two of you, this is what I want. You can alternate, but if one of you could, at 6.30, go over to the door, kind of have it cracked open, have one foot in, one foot out, and be greeting students as they come through. Hey Susie, hey Billy, are you in seventh grade? Are you in 12th grade? <laughs> you know, just saying, welcome, we're so glad you're here. Things like that. Um, that is going to make students feel very welcomed. They're going to find their rooms a lot easier. They're not gonna be knocking on a room hoping that it's theirs. Um, so I want, uh, plan right now, one of you to be at the door, 6.30, um, right off the bat as students come in. Of course, you can alternate, but as long as one of you is sitting there waving, um, we can make that hallway feel very welcoming for these students. So that's number one. 
Whew. All right, the second thing is that while you're sitting in your rooms from 6.30 to 7, you're probably thinking, what am I supposed to do with these students? You know, usually they'd be playing nine square basketball. They'd be like playing video games or something, but they're in your room and that's it right now. So what should you be doing? That's a great question. Um, for the first night, we're going to give you, uh, so not next week, but the 30th, we're going to give you some get to know you questions. As soon as, as soon as a student comes in, you can give it to them. They fill out their name, their interests, their hobbies. You might know that student very very well, but maybe you can learn even more about them. Um, that's just going to happen only the first night so that you can go through at night, see your students, get to know them better because knowing is loving. Um, so that's probably, we're going to give you an easy activity for the first night. Uh, but another thing you can do is play games, chat, ask questions. If you are someone who likes to plan beforehand, you're like, I need to have a game in my head. This is what I want you to do. And actually, I'm going to ask everyone to do this. Feel free. Well, actually, go ahead and take out your phones. Yep. Grab your phones, hold them up, wave them around. I can't see them, but I'm trusting you to do it. Okay. And I need you to go to your web browser, Google Chrome or whatever it is. Go to your web browser and type in this website. Are you ready? It's sg, sg, leaders dot card dot co. I'll put it up on the screen. Sg leaders dot c a r r d dot co. Go ahead and put that in. I'll give you five more seconds. Press enter. Awesome. It's going to bring you to something called the small, uh, the Browncroft student small group leader resource page. So while you're here, you'll notice that there's a lot of things you can do. One is you can go to games and activities. And as soon as you click it, boom, up pops some icebreaker games, some group games, and some teaching activities. So you can look at those beforehand, come up with an icebreaker. As soon as students come in, they're getting involved right in a game, and it's an easy way to get in the group and not feel awkward. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, another thing is you might notice that some of the more shy and reserved students are going to kind of go off by their own. They're going to get on their phone and start scrolling around. Um, those are the students that you need need to uh, go after, ask them questions, get to know them, make them feel very welcome. A one-on-one -on -one experience is a lot easier than a 10-on-1 -on -one experience when they're getting asked in front of this huge group. So make that connection before, um, before that 7 o'clock starts. Um, that's very important. So You've waved them all in. Everyone's in. The, uh, you know, it's 6.50. We're about to get started. This is what I need you to do. This is the second thing. You need to take attendance, and this is super important. So again, take your phones out and open up the LEAD app. Some of you just downloaded this, but open up your LEAD app and sign in. And what you're going to find out is that you can see your group. It has a list of my groups right here. You're going to click on your group. Do it right now with me. Click on your group. Click attendance. And there you can take attendance. Now, it's very important to get attendance because uh, we want to know who's showing up. We want to know who hasn't been here in a while so we can encourage them. And we want to make sure that we know that you, the leader, ha are here. So make sure to click yourself on the attendance app. This is going to happen every time, okay? You're going to be taking attendance as the announcements are going, things like that. Um, and submit and you're good to go. All right. You can take your phone, put it in your pocket by this point. So at the beginning of the night, I will do announcements. I will do uh, just get, get welcoming students, and then we're going to go into a game. So I'm going to show you what game time might look like. All right, game time is going to be fun this year. Oh, I almost forgot something. <laughs> One thing that I want to really stress is this. Um, because we are a team, we are the family ministry team, we are the student team, I want you guys to be wearing your team shirts, your team jerseys every week. Yes, you might have to 
figure out how to do laundry, right? Or maybe you're like, I'm good for four uses or something like that. But I really want our uh, leaders to be wearing our uh, student t-shirts, our team jerseys, if you will. And that just shows uniformity. It shows that we're all ready to go. We're on our game. We're showing up mentally. And um, it also makes the students feel like they're a part of something. They're, they have their uh, team captains or their leaders uh, they're all ready to go. And also masks, just to reiterate, are going to be worn all night. Um, these masks look really cool. I've been told by many, where can they get these masks? So this will be great. Um, students are to keep that on at all times as well. Uh, yeah, wanted to say that before we jump into game time. But speaking of teamwork and teams, <laughs> this is a great segue into game time, which is going to look a little different this year. You guys remember some of you on Wednesday Night Live, our online uh, version of youth group last semester. Um, we did a lot of games that students could play online. And because we're doing a two-track ministry, we're going to try to be creative and do games that are still able to be done online. Now, it's going to look a little different, though. So I want you to imagine this. Get in this headspace. It is game time. Your students are ready to play. What might it look like? Well, it's going to look like this. Your students, your, you as a small group, are going to be a team, okay? You are a team. Seventh grade boys is a team. Eleventh grade girls is a team. You guys are a team, and you're going to be competing against all the other small groups. So we're going to try to do a variety of different timed challenges, creative challenges, things like that. Um, and then I'll get all the results. And then the next week, we're going to celebrate whoever won. I think I'm going to keep a, uh, a leaderboard to see who's doing the best over the year, but it should be fun. So um, as we transition into worship time, um, which I'll explain what it will be like, I'm going to give you a little bit longer of a time to transition. So hang tight for like 30 to 45 seconds. All right, here we go. So worship time is going to be really interesting this year because I got together with Colin and we both talked. We're like, man, if, if I were a seventh grade boy and I saw worship coming through the TV, you know, I have two options, right? I can either sing and embarrass myself, maybe, or I cannot sing and it's just awkward and maybe I'd embarrass myself anyway. So, so I thought, man, is worship even worth it to do on Wednesday nights? And we, we talked through it. What if we do it once a month? What, how can we make this a, a time that is an add, a value add to the night and not just an awkward time for the night? So we really were racking our brains around it. And this is kind of where we landed. We're like, hey, what if students uh, could do, instead of just having two options, they could have, uh, you know, sing or not sing. They could actually have three productive options. Um, so you're asking, what could they do? Well, we, this is what's going to happen. When we do worship time, we're actually going to offer three options. One, we're going to say from the front, me, I'll say, students, if you feel comfortable singing, if you love using your voice to glorify God and give back to him, we want you to sing during this time. If you don't feel comfortable singing, especially in a small group setting, there's two other options you can do. One is you can draw and you can hear the music and draw uh, whatever it inspires you to draw, make it connected and you can worship through your art. And third, you can worship through journaling. For those who don't like singing, they don't feel artistic, but they're deep thinkers. They'll uh, love to journal and, and write down things about the song. We'll give some prompts. Um, and you're probably asking, are we going to have paper? Like, do we need to provide paper? Great question. In your boxes uh, or in your rooms in about two weeks, hopefully, when you're actually in your rooms, we're going to have 
specialized, customized journals for each student that stay in the room. So your students are going to have their own personalized journal with their name on it, and it's something that they'll be able to draw in, they'll, they'll be able to take notes in, they'll be able to process things in. Uh, it's that's the hope and I, I'm excited for what that's going to do because I know as a kid even though I sing now I didn't sing when I was in sixth grade but I did draw I love drawing so this is going to open up some opportunities make it less awkward feel free to have your students like go to the corner lay down and draw you know they can really spread out at this time and those kids who like have, are more introverted and love reflecting, they love like the, the quiet times. This is gonna be their favorite part of the night by far, I think, we'll see. Um, but I'm really excited to see how that works out. Uh, again, singing, journaling, drawing, uh, we're gonna have pencils and all the materials available for that. So that is how worship is gonna go. We're gonna have one song to start off and then maybe two songs. We'll see how it's working out. Um, but that is how worship is gonna happen this, uh, yeah, this year. So pray with, <laughs> pray that it goes well. We're, we're trying. So we're open to suggestions as well, but we feel confident about this. Awesome. We're going to head to truth time. Um, now we're into truth time. Some of you who watch Wednesday Night Live, a lot of you leaders, know that this is the lesson time, right? Um, I'll get up and speak. Steve will get up and speak. You'll see someone come up and speak and give the lesson for the night. And obviously what I'm hoping for this year is that it is there's always a scripture reference. There's always a, a thing to get in the Bible, and it always relates back to Jesus and what he's done for us. Um, so I, that's going to be the meat of the lessons uh, that are going to come from this time, at least the content. Uh, but it's going to be slightly different from last uh, last year or even last semester. We used to have it be about 15 minutes long, um, reevaluating and just thinking about what these students are going through each day, which is watching like three hours of class, maybe more. Um, I'm going to try to shorten it down to less than 10 minutes. And that's not to lose content, but that's just to uh, have the kids be more engaged. We want them to be engaged uh, and, and not fall away and get distracted. So we're going to keep the lessons shorter, hopefully less looking at the screen and more engagement. So that's what's going to happen. And tonight I am going to give a message to you guys as small group leaders. Um, it's something that I want to charge you with. It's one of my visions for the entire year. And it has to do with heaven. Yeah, you're probably thinking, okay, Aaron, um, Yes, heaven relates to everything, I get it. But how does heaven relate to my job as a small group leader specifically? Um, well, I want you to watch this video and then I'm gonna talk briefly after it. But I want you to really engage with this video. For some of you, it might uh, be right smack dab aligned with what you think about when you think about heaven. Um, but I know for me, when I first watched this, it was a challenge and it was something that I'm like, Oh, I guess I never truly realized this. Um, so I'm going to play this video for you now. Be thinking and engaging, and I'll be right back after it. So here we go. Here's the video. So in the Bible, the ideas of heaven and earth are ways of talking about God's space and our space. So I understand our space really well. We live here. There's trees, rivers, mountains. But my understanding of God's space gets a little fuzzy. And what we do get in the Bible are images trying to help us grasp God's space, which is basically inconceivable to us. So these are two very different types of spaces. Yes, they're, they're different in their nature, but here's what's really interesting is that in the Bible, these are not always separate spaces. So think of heaven and earth as like different dimensions that can overlap in the same exact space. So we talk a lot about going to heaven after we die, but 
this idea of heaven and earth overlapping, we don't talk a lot about that. Which is kind of crazy because the union of heaven and earth is what the story of the Bible is all about. How they were once fully united and then driven apart and about how God is bringing them back together once again. So let's go back to the beginning where heaven and earth, they're completely overlapping. Yeah, this is what uh, the Bible's description of the Garden of Eden is all about. It's a place where God and humanity dwelt together perfectly, no separation, and, and humans then partner with God in building a flourishing, beautiful world and so on. But as humans, we wanted to do things a different way. We wanted God out and we wanted to create a world apart from him. Yeah, so we have these two spaces now. And the Bible actually uses lots of different kinds of words and phrases to refer to these two spaces to make a a clear distinction. So you've said that these spaces can overlap, though. So explain how that works. Yeah, this is where we have to start talking about temples. Because in the biblical world, you experience God's presence by going to a temple. That's where heaven and earth uh, overlap. Now, there are two types of temples described in the Bible. One is a tabernacle, basically a tent that was built by Moses. And the other was this massive building made by Solomon. And these temples were decorated with fruit trees and flowers and images of angels and all kinds of gold and jewels and so on. And these are designed to make you feel like you're going back to the garden. And at the center of the temple was a place called the Holy of Holies, which was like the hot spot of God's presence. Now we can go and be with God again. But not so fast, because the temple also creates a problem. So, God's space is full of his presence and goodness and justice and beauty, but human space is full of sin and injustice and the ugliness that results. So, how do these spaces overlap if they're so different and they're in conflict with each other? This was resolved through animal sacrifice. Yeah, that's kind of weird. What do animal sacrifices have to do with this? Yeah, the the idea is this. Animal sacrifices, somehow they absorb the sin when the animal dies in your place. And it creates a clean space, so to speak, where you are now free to enter into the temple and be in God's presence. Okay, so if I'm an Israelite and I live in Jerusalem, I might be able to be in God's presence. But you said the story of the Bible is all of heaven and earth reuniting. Right. So, we have to keep going in the story where we come to Jesus in the New Testament. And in the Gospel of John, we hear this claim that God became human in Jesus and made his dwelling among us. Now, this word dwelling is really curious. Literally, it means he set up a tabernacle among us. And so, what John is claiming right here is that Jesus is a temple. He is now the place where heaven and earth overlap. What's interesting about Jesus is that he isn't staying in this safe, clean space. He's running around hanging out with sinners. He's healing people of their sicknesses and forgiving people of their sins. He's basically creating little pockets of heaven where people can be in God's presence, but he's doing it out there in the middle of the world of sin and death. And he keeps telling everyone that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he even told his followers to pray regularly that God's kingdom come and that his will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. But a lot of people are threatened by Jesus and they kill him, which seems to spoil this whole plan to reunite heaven and earth. But we we have to go back to a scene earlier on in Jesus' story where John the Baptist saw Jesus and said, Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus isn't just talked about as being a temple. He's also talked about as being the temple sacrifice. Yeah, so so the cross is now the place where Jesus absorbs sin to create a clean space that is not limited like animal sacrifices. Jesus' sacrifice has the power to keep spreading and spreading and reuniting more and more of heaven and earth. And this is all really great, but it leaves one big question in my mind, which is, what happens when I die? Don't I just fly over to God's space to be with Jesus. Yeah, so a few times in the New Testament, we learn that Christians will be with Jesus in heaven after they die, but that is not the focus of the Bible's story. The focus is on how heaven and earth are being reunited through Jesus and will be completely brought together one day when he returns. So, in the book of Revelation, we get this beautiful image of the Garden of Eden, now in the form of a city, coming 
to end the age of sin and death by redeeming all of human history in a renewed creation. And God's space and human space completely overlap once again. There we go. (laughs) I do love the Bible Project. They're so good for just putting biblical concepts into a visual kind of learning, which I know a lot of our students are visual learners. I am a visual learner. So this is so helpful for me. So now, now comes the question, Aaron, why does this relate to our job as small group leaders? So much so that you want to talk about it on like the night that we're doing our training. Um, here we go. This is it. Um, what you saw in this video is that in Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth and Adam and Eve, and they dwelled together, right? The, the circle, the Venn diagram with heaven and earth together. And that was that's what God wants. He wants for his presence to dwell with mankind on this earth. But through Adam and Eve's sin, uh, it was separated. But the whole story arc of the Bible, all the way to Revelation, is to get back to that spot. And not just get back to it, but build upon it. From a garden to a city. A city where people are doing God's will on this earth. And, you know, it gives a different look. Instead of heaven as the place you go where you die, heaven is redefined as the place where God's presence is and where God's kingdom uh, reigns, right? And we see through Jesus that this is how he thought of heaven. He said, he, he prayed to God and said, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus definitely believes that God's will that's being done in heaven can be done on earth. And we see through Jesus, through the way he heals, the way he just cares for each other, everyone, the way he loves, through all of his stories, we see that God's kingdom is being revealed on earth. And because of his sacrifice this day, we can now bring God's kingdom to earth. In Revelation, at the end of the Bible, starting in Genesis, Revelation, it says that in 20, Revelation 21, 4, that um, there will be no more mourning or crying or pain. None of that. The old order of things has passed away and behold, a new has come. And that's not just something for the end of end of times, right? That is something that can happen happen on this earth today through the Holy Spirit. So this is my huge charge, my big picture, 10,000 foot hope for youth group this year. It's this. It's that when these students come through these doors and walk into these small group rooms, that they experience the kingdom of God in those rooms, that their leaders are caring for them, are asking them, knowing them, are showing them grace, are just cultivating relationships that reflect God's kingdom. So it doesn't matter if they just came from a hard home situation, they are finding relief and goodness in the people of God. It doesn't matter if if they are at war with a friend, right? When they come to small group, they are understand a new way of living where there is life and love through Jesus Christ. And it's through those interactions and those relationships that are so fulfilling that our students will be enamored with the love of Jesus and think, this is a way I want to live. I want to live as part of the kingdom of God. And that's where you come in. It's so crucial that our leaders are in the word. We're seeking God. We're not perfect. No, (laughs) I'm not asking you to be perfect. You know, I am like, wow, this kid's getting on my nerves. Like, got to check myself, right? Like, oh, I forgot to do the lead app, (laughs) right? We're not perfect, but God uses imperfect people throughout the entire Bible to bring his kingdom to earth. And it's shown through Jesus how to do that. So that's what we want to show our students. We want them to fall in love with the way and life of Jesus Christ. So would you bow and pray with me? Um, Dear Lord, uh, we just, we just come before you today humbled, knowing that we uh, by ourselves cannot do anything to transform this world for good, Lord. We know that it's only through you that we can bless those around us, Lord. We know that uh, through your son, Jesus, you came and showed us the way. You showed us how to live and you showed us how to bring your presence into our lives and uh, have others around us experience your presence, Lord. Um, But we need you in order to make that happen, Lord. This whole year, I pray that you would just equip us with your love, um, equip us, give us courage and boldness to pursue pursue you daily 
Um, give us grace for uh, ourselves. Forgive us when we fall short, which we will probably have already today, Lord. But we just pray that these students come into this place and experience the kingdom of God um, through your people. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Awesome, guys. Well, we have one more section left, and this section is called... All right, awesome. Now hold on to all your thoughts about what was just shared, the message just shared, because I know that you have thoughts about it. Um, In fact, that phrase, I have thoughts, came from me when I was in some seminary courses. The teacher would say something to me, the student, and I would turn to my friend and go, "I I have thoughts. And what that really meant was I was thinking about it I wanted to process through some stuff and talk about it because I had formed some thoughts um, and opinions that I wanted to share, right? Um, So this section is called I Have Thoughts for a couple reasons. One, I didn't want students to look at the the schedule for the night and see discussion time. Because I feel like if I was a student and I just saw discussion time, I'd go, oh, great. This is where this is. I know what this is, right? This is where the teacher asks me questions and we're all supposed to talk freely, right? And it doesn't always work that way. Um, So that's one reason I have thoughts. But another reason is because I want to completely reframe how we go about small group time. And that's a big statement. I'm really, as I said it out, out loud, that is a big statement to say that. But this is what I actually want, okay? For those of you who've been a small group leader, this is how it usually works, and you can correct me afterwards if this isn't how it went, but whoop, hit the microphone. But what usually happens was I would teach, you as the leader would synthesize the information, okay, got it, okay, got it, that scripture, good. And then you'd get to small group and you'd list off the questions and say, you know, when did, what verse did God show friendship, show forgiveness? And they answer, right? Then you ask a question and they answer and you ask a question and they answer. Um, That's a perfectly good way of, of processing through the information. But what I really want is to flip it. And what do you mean by that? This is what I want to happen. I want students to get to a point where I, I uh, preach and then I tell them, Hey students, I know that you guys are smart and you are thinking of these things. So at this point, I want to hear your thoughts. I know you've been thinking about it. I want you guys, did you agree, disagree? Is that hard? Would you even want to tell a friend this or does it sound like it's crazy? I want to hear your thoughts. And then as the leader, you get to uh, sit back and you're a peer. You're no longer a teacher in a classroom. Don't view yourself as a teacher in a classroom, okay, where you hand out a test, the students answer, and then you're good to go. No, you are a peer, you're an active listener. Sometimes sitting in a circle is a really good way to show that you just want to listen and process through it with them. Now, some of you are thinking, there's no way my students can just have thoughts after them. You know, they're going to be like, I don't even know where to begin. And I understand that, so I've done something to help you guys out. Give me a second. If you look in your bins, you're going to find a couple of these. They're called uh, I Have Thoughts Bible Analysis. And what I'm trying to do here is get students to figure out how to have thoughts, right, in a biblical way. We want them to uh, be able to read the Bible and apply it to their own life. So you'll see some things on here. Um, You'll see a thing about context. Who wrote this? Who was it written for? When was it written? And one of my favorite ones, if you look at the bottom, is in what style was it written? Was this poetry? Was this an epic story? Was this a legal document or a written mailed letter, (laughs) right? And that will help get students to frame, okay, I understand why this was written. Uh, The second thing is the truth. What does this say about God? What does this say about humanity? Um, And the last thing is, what main truth is this passage wanting you to consider or believe? So they can go through that. And then the last one, which is the section, is my thoughts. They have thoughts and these are going to be them. After they've done this, they're going to see how does this passage interact with current American culture? 
Does it clash with culture? Does it align with culture? Again, some of you, you're like, our students aren't going <laughs> to, they're going to have no chance at this. But I've seen sixth graders and seventh graders answer questions like this. They are thinking about these things. And, and the last one is, uh, I have thoughts. What are your general thoughts? Did you agree, disagree? Was this hard to believe? Did this remind you of something? How are you going to change from this moment forward? And again, this is a process. It's going to be like building a muscle. Our students don't all know how to do something like this and form their own thoughts yet. They, they don't even have a, a template to do that. So we're trying to provide that for them today. And as a leader, one thing you can do that's going to be absolutely crucial for these students is model this. When, when we get into the I have thoughts section, you know what? You are someone who's a step ahead of them, a couple steps. And they are looking to you for how to think biblically about some stuff. So if you have thoughts about how this relates to your work, how this relates to your family life, how this relates to whatever it may be, your students are listening and they'll begin to understand how you think through things. And if you think through things biblically, it will be attractive for them to think through things biblically. So um, one thing that you can do uh, is uh, hand this out, split them into groups of three. You don't have to do this with them. They can do it on their own. Split them into groups of three, have them go to separate corners, fill that out for 10 minutes. You come back, you talk about it. Um, this is going to be a, a new way of doing uh, the small groups. Some of you may have done it this way before, but what we really want is for students to be able to say their thoughts and for you to guide them and mentor them, not necessarily tell them what's right, tell them what's wrong, but we're teaching them how to think biblically. Okay. And this is the framework to do that. Um, those of you in the high school groups, you, your students uh, may get to the point where they're doing this in their heads. They don't need a paper anymore. So you are just talking about your thoughts. How does this relate to drinking? How does this relate to friendships? And that's kind of the point we want to get at. So where our students are thinking biblically on their own and they don't need a teacher to ask them questions to get there. Woo. <laughs> so that's a lot. I'm actually going to give you guys a couple minutes to go through this and we're going to use Revelation 21 for our message, our, our verse from my talk. And I want you to go through this today. All right. Giving you that time. Here we go.
Awesome. I hope you had a good time with that. I know some of our students are going to love this work, uh, this little template and exercise, and some are going to not like it. <laughs> um, but we're building those muscles, right? In order for them to think biblically, they got to work out those muscles. So that's what we're doing for our students. Um, so you've come to the end of the night. Say your discussion, you know, came to a natural end. It was a, a good time. What happens next? Um, something that I really, 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 really want to happen is prayer requests and prayer. Um, I know some of you, you're like, we never have time for that. Well, we're in small groups all the time now, so you're going to have time for it, and I want you to make time for it. Why do I think prayer requests are so important? For many reasons. Um, one, it's important for students to know that God cares about what's going on in their life. Um, it's important. It's so important that you want to hear what's going on and you want to bring it to the creator of the universe. So it teaches them that God cares about what's going on in their life. Um, it also teaches them that that God that prayer matters. That it, prayer isn't something that's just just off in the distance and it just doesn't do anything, right? Prayer is something um, that God hears and, and wants to respond because he's a good, good father. And it changes our hearts in the process. Going to God with our struggles and our praises is one of the most crucial things we can teach our students. And as a leader, you, uh, you need to model what it looks like to bring things before God. This is, this is an awesome time. I'm telling you, prayer request is a really amazing time to be vulnerable and to get other kids to open up. I know personally, I had a, this was last year um, in one of the groups. I, my grandma was going through cancer treatment. She just found out she had cancer. And so I gave that prayer request. I'm like, I'm really scared. My grandma is going through cancer treatment. Uh, I don't know why it's happening. She's the greatest ever. And then two other students, sixth grade boys, shared that they were also scared about their grandma and coming near uh, to death. And because, I mean, I don't want to credit to me, but I've seen this before where I have co-leaders that let their guard down and bring something before God. And it causes our students to see that and go, oh, I... I also have something that I'd like to bring before God. So it's a great time to model what it looks like to bring something to God in prayer. Also, um, prayer in general is a powerful thing. <laughs> so praying for your students is so crucial. I, I encourage you to pray every night for your students, but definitely pray with them in front of them um, and talk to God. So prayer requests and praying. Um, you can do popcorn prayer. You can do just one person prays. You, the leader, could pray until someone one day asks to pray. Um, but prayer requests, highly, highly, that's something I want you guys doing. Um, and I think it could make a big impact in our students' lives. Wonderful. All right. We're at the end, end, end of the night. Shake it out. Stand up. Do a 360. I hope some of you actually did that. <laughs> I really do, um, because we are at the end of the night, and there's one last uh, or two last logistical things that are very important. So um, I'm just going to play a transition just to show that show something. Here we go. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, I want everyone to grab their phones again. These handy dandy devices. Oh, I didn't say this, but. Um, you can come up uh, with rules for the off the grid box, AKA students putting their phones away. Um, my suggestion is as before the program starts at seven, like at 6.55, 6.59, everyone throws it in the bin and they get them after your prayer. That's my suggestion. But um, if you wanna do it the whole time, go for it. Uh, that's my suggestion. But grab your phones because as students' parents arrive, we went through like apps and walkie talkies and we're trying to figure out how can we get parents to communicate uh, to get their student to come. But what we landed on is the very simple, you will get a text from your student's uh, parent. So it'll say, hey, this is Marsha, um, Jimmy Nolan uh, can be picked up. 
and you'll see that text and you'll send them out the door. Security will escort them down. So that's how we're gonna do dismissal. Just always have your, your phone on you for that time because parents will be texting you. Another reason this is good is because you'll have all the parents' phone numbers. So they'll feel like they have a connection with you. You'll start to learn their names and I think it'll just be a, a, a really nifty experience. So have your phone on you for dismissal text messaging okay and then the last thing last but not least is this oh yeah a sanitation kit you thought you were gonna make it out <laughs> basically uh, for the night we just have to sanitize some surfaces before we leave so you can grab us some students to help with this but um, basically what you do is if surfaces have been touched like uh, tables, things like that, doorknobs, especially high touch surfaces. You're gonna take the, oh, here it is, the sanitizer. <laughs> take the sanitizer and spray, spray that area. Use the paper towels to wipe it up. So that's doorknobs, that's tables, that's uh, the toilet, uh, which you can use. Um, that, that's the toilet as well. Um, so that's the big thing. After you've done that, you're gonna find this clipboard. You're gonna write the date, the time, um, put your initials, um, give a little check mark for cleaned. Um, let, let them know what group you are, 10th grade boys, something like that. So again, sanitizer, spray any high touch surfaces, wipe it down, fill it out, done for the night. Um, and then after that, you will be free to go. Wow, you guys did it! You did it, you did an entire youth group night. Give yourself a round of applause. That was great. All right, at this time, I'm gonna have you guys, feel free, stand up in your chairs right now um, and head down to the cafe. If you touched anything, if you need to sanitize any surfaces, do that. And then we're gonna head to the cafe and finish out the night. You guys rock. All right, we'll see you in the cafe in a couple minutes. All right, bye.